Hey friends, I hope that you're doing well. A little more than six months ago, we looked at one of Jesus' parables in Luke chapter 18, the parable of the persistent widow. There he told about a widow whose adversaries were coming after her, so she began to pester this unjust judge to bring her some justice. Verses 4 and 5 says, For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. Well, Jesus' point was that if an unjust judge is willing to give in to her persistently irritating cries, even if it's begrudgingly, just think how our perfectly good and righteous Heavenly Father will bring justice when we persistently persevere and pray with the expectation that He will respond, He will answer. Jesus concluded in verse 8, saying, I tell you, He will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, will we be faithful to pray for God's justice and his will to be done, regardless of the unjust nature of our culture that keeps condemning us and pressuring us to conform to their ungodly ways? Will we have enough faith to persistently pray for deliverance and the strength to continue on for Christ? Now. I believe that most Christians are expecting that hard times will soon come and that our faith will be tested more and more. Adversity and persecution will increase according to God's word. But no matter how hot the fiery trials get, please, my friends, do not lose heart. We have a just and loving God who will see that justice is done. And his point here is that we keep praying. We continue to be faithful, and we press on for the Lord, for his sake. Now, our parable in Luke chapter 11 has a similar theme of persistent prayer with a slightly different twist. It's preceded by Jesus teaching his disciples what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's interesting that Luke is known for recording Jesus' praying more frequently than the other gospel writers. In fact, nine times we see Jesus praying in Luke's gospel, and seven of those times are found only in Luke. Chapter 11 begins with Jesus finishing his prayer time, and one of his disciples asked that he teach them to pray. So Jesus said, pray this way, and he taught them the Lord's prayer. Immediately he followed with a what-if scenario. Now, it doesn't say it's a parable, but it sounds like one. Beginning in verse 5, we read, and he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though, he will not rise and give because he's his friend. Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, Will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, obviously, like the parable of the persistent widow, this too focuses on being persistent in prayer, and the reluctant man gives in to the stubborn determination of his friend. He also shows a contrast between sinful but good fathers who will gladly give what their children ask for with the perfectly holy Heavenly Father who will always give good, give good gifts to his children when we ask him. 
So the simple theme of the story is that we're to come at any time, no matter how simple the need may be, and to be persistent and bold in our asking. Whatever we are asking for, if it's in the realm of God's will, he will give it to us. But what I want to do right now is focus on the latter part of verse 13. Jesus says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, this almost seems out of place and contradictory because believers don't have to ask for the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Spirit of God the moment that we were born again. Paul said, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So he's not saying that we have to ask for the Holy Spirit. Now, let me share John MacArthur's explanation because he explains it far better than I could. He said, quote, when you go to ask God for whatever you ask for, whatever it is, God gives you the Holy Spirit. You ask for comfort, he gave you the comforter. You ask for help, he gave you the helper. You ask for truth, he gave you the truth teacher. You ask for power, he gave you the spirit of power. You ask for wisdom, he gave you the spirit of wisdom. You ask for guidance, he gave you the guide. You ask for love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. And he gave you the spirit whose fruit were released in your life. You see, this is the generosity of God. You ask for the gift, he gives the giver. You ask for the effect, he gives the cause. You ask for the product, he gives the source, end quote. In other words, friends, whenever we make requests of God, the Holy Spirit, whom we already have, if we are surrendered to him, he brings our requests in line with God's perfect will so that he can answer, so that he will answer, and we can expect him to answer. The fruit of the Holy Spirit's presence and influence will be answered prayer because we will ask according to his will. We ask for the gift. God graciously gives us the giver. The Apostle Paul summarized it this way. He said, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, of course, that's the Holy Spirit, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that's Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. You see, loved ones, God already knows how needy we are. And so he says, let me go above and beyond what they could ever ask for. I'll just pour my spirit out into them. And so with the Holy Spirit indwelling us, loved ones, we truly have everything that we could possibly need. God does not act like this grouchy neighbor who begrudgingly gives us what we ask for. He willingly, joyfully, and generously gave us more than we could ever ask for in the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank God for his good and gracious gift. Let's pray. Loving Father, we're not worthy of your kindness and your generosity, but I pray that you would overwhelm us with your goodness, fill us with your joy and your presence. Teach us, Lord, to find contentment and, sa and satisfaction in you. And we ask this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, be encouraged, my friends. God is good and faithful, and he loves us all much more than any of us could ever imagine. So may he bless you real good, as Billy Graham used to say. God willing, we'll see you next time. Bye.